coming up on Market to Market. Another series of tornadoes leaves a path of destruction on the Southern Plains. Less severe storms bring vital moisture to the Corn Belt, but dampen planting prospects. And losses in two Midwestern states due to avian flu are expected to approach a billion dollars. Those stories and market analysis with Don Rose next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, May 22 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Responding to persistent drought, some California farmers have offered to give up 25% of their water this year in exchange for being spared from deeper mandatory cuts in the future. That's a rare concession by some of the Golden State's strongest water rights holders. Late Friday afternoon, regulators accepted that proposal. And speaking in Connecticut this week, President Obama seized on changing weather patterns to push his agenda fighting climate change. There are folks who will equivocate. They'll say, you know, I'm not a scientist. Well, I'm not either. But the best scientists in the world know that climate change is happening. Our analysts in the intelligence community know climate change is happening. The president used his commencement speech this week to the Coast Guard Academy to say warming temperatures and rising tides pose a serious threat to global security. The science is indisputable. The fossil fuels we burn release carbon dioxide, which traps heat. And the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are now higher than they have been in 800,000 years. The planet is getting warmer. 14 of the 15 hottest years on record have been in the past 15 years. Some in the GOP-led Congress have disputed the science of climate change or distanced themselves from the issue, including those on the presidential campaign trail. Other critics countered the president misused an opportunity to talk about a secure America. On his Facebook page, Texas Congressman Mac Thornberry said the president, quote, opted to expand the missions for our overtaxed military by putting them on the front lines of his war on fossil fuels. Climate change will impact every country on the planet. No nation is immune. So I'm here today to say that climate change constitutes a serious threat to global security, an immediate risk to our national security. And make no mistake, it will impact how our military defends our country. And so we need to act, and we need to act now. The weather waits for no one, as indicated by patterns this week in the Southern Plains. More than two dozen tornadoes were spawned in Texas and Oklahoma again this week, leaving significant damage in many areas, including the east central Texas town of Giddings. But it was the rainfall that will likely make a bigger impact on the region, as flooding now is a major concern from Kansas to the Gulf Coast. Weekly precipitation tallies, as estimated by IntelliCast, revealed portions of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Oklahoma all received more than eight inches of rainfall in the last seven days. The much-needed moisture did improve drought conditions in some of the region, as indicated on the University of Nebraska's drought monitor. USDA meteorologists also report some rivers on the southern plains are at their highest level since 1990. The deluge pushed Texas reservoirs to nearly 80% of capacity, their highest level in four years. Oklahoma City and Wichita Falls, Texas are nearing record monthly rainfall totals following the week of rain. Shreveport, Louisiana residents who were inundated with a record rainfall this week of more than four inches falling in a single day. The weather pattern has slowed crop planting to a crawl in locations most impacted by the weather. According to USDA's weekly crop progress report, only 35% of the nation's cotton has been planted, 
well below the five-year pace of 46 percent. After a blistering pace earlier this month, corn planting also has slowed. USDA estimates that 85 percent of America's corn crop is in the ground, 10 points better than the five-year average. Soybean planting is also well above the pace. 45 percent of America's primary oil seeds have been sown thanks to a 14-point increase over last week's report. The Iowa Department of Agriculture issued an order late this week canceling all live bird exhibitions at county fairs, the Iowa State Fair, and other gatherings of birds due to the outbreak of avian influenza. The ban begins immediately, is effective through the end of 2015, and also prohibits live birds from being sold at auctions, swap meets, and exotic sales. The Centers for Disease Control and the Iowa Department of Public Health say the virus poses virtually no risk to people since it has never been detected in humans. There will, however, be an economic impact. Shoppers are already paying higher prices for poultry products and losses due to avian flu in two Midwestern states are expected to soar to an all-time high. Iowa, the nation's top egg producer, and Minnesota, which leads the country in turkey production, are taking the hardest hit for H5N2, also known as the avian flu. Estimates released this week assess the economic costs of the virus at close to $1 billion in those two states alone. Iowa is still reporting new cases. So far, the Hawkeye state has lost some 20 million birds, a third of the state's laying population. All told, nearly 40 million birds have been destroyed in 15 states. There's no question that this is going to take some period of time to get our industry up on its feet. Uh, I've talked to producers that indicate it could be anywhere from 12 to 18 to 24 months before their barns are fully repopulated. And so uh, I think it's important to know that producers are fully engaged in looking at the future. The Agriculture Department's Research Service and its Southeast Poultry Research Lab are working to evaluate and develop avian influenza vaccines. But Minnesota may already be turning the corner. While the Gopher State has lost more than 8 million turkeys to date, authorities released reports this week stating no new cases have been detected in the previous seven days. It does provide a window of opportunity for us to collect some scientific data, which allows us to better formulate uh, the uh, platform's idea plans that will hopefully will assist our producers to prepare for the future. I think we should be uh, very engaged in addressing this issue and understanding it, understanding it scientifically and how it's moving. I think we need to continue to remind the public there's no food safety issue here. No person has ever been able to contract H5N2. Uh, so we don't need to alarm folks to that degree. Consumers, however, are feeling the pressure at the grocery store. Egg prices have jumped 58% in the last month and climbed at a rate of 5% per day for the last week. KGAN News in Cedar Rapids, Iowa reported this week that if trends continue, an estimated 30% reduction in Iowa's poultry output for one year would result in a loss of about 2,450 jobs and cut the state's gross domestic product by $290 million. We've seen the consumers still stay pretty strong in, in wanting the choice of having eggs at least through all the, the turmoil of this, is, this issue and all the, the news reporting. So we've seen that, I'm sure, as prices have an impact here and just sheer availability. Those losses are being exacerbated by reduced demand in foreign markets. The USDA estimates American exports of Turkey will fall this year by 10% while egg shipments will decline at a more modest 1.5%. Although the broiler industry has yet to be affected by avian flu, exports of chicken meat are anticipated to fall by nearly 7%. That plunge is blamed on import bans that have been imposed in lucrative foreign markets, including China, Russia, South Korea, and Mexico. Restrictions on imports date back to mid-December, when South Korea announced it would not accept any U.S. poultry products. Import bans in Mexico are gradually being lifted, and as the outbreak declines, South Korea, Russia, and China are expected to follow suit.
Next, the Market to Market Report. Grain prices were mixed this week as the trade pondered prospects for rising interest rates, persistent rains in the grain belt, and a resurgent U.S. dollar. For the week, July wheat gained four cents, while the nearby corn contract moved six cents lower. Soybeans also retreated as the July contract declined 29 cents. Nearby meal bucked the bearish trend with a gain of 90 cents per ton. In the softs, cotton gave back all of last week's gains and then some as the July contract lost more than 350 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, May Class 3 milk gained a penny. In the livestock sector, prices were mixed as the June cattle contract lost 39 cents, nearby feeders advanced by 60 cents, and the June lean hog contract improved by 38 cents. In the currency markets, the euro lost two basis points against the U.S. dollar. Crude oil eked out a modest gain of three cents per barrel. Comex Gold declined by 21.30 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost nearly two points to settle at 4.44.10. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Don Rose. Don, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. Now, this was an interesting market in the wheat pit. We saw a stronger dollar, heavy rains across the uh, southern plains, and yet we saw wheat up almost a nickel here this week. Talk to us about what's happening in that market. Well, what's really happened to the wheat market is May 5th we bottomed in the wheat, and it was just plain too crowded. Uh, heavily, the funds heavily short, record short around May 5th, and uh, we just ran out of bearish news. Then the news started to change just a little bit. We got uh, too much rain in some of the areas, a little bit too dry in uh, Russia, a little bit too dry in western uh, Canada. So the funds short covered up into some tough resistance, Mike, back up into that 530, 550 range, which is certainly a tough area. But you have to ask yourself, do you think contract lows have been established or not? And you think they very well might be? Well, no, I think it's a low bet. I think when you look at the uh, uh, wet conditions, uh, probably more of a quality concern than anything else. But probably some of the moisture actually hurt, uh, helps some of the wheat. So I think it's a real question mark. You have to ask yourself, is the crop getting bigger or smaller? You know, this time of year as we're approaching harvest, harvest is going to start to pick up as we get into June. And, uh, you know, we look at it, we think it's a probability that we go down, challenge the uh, 420, 440 range again in July wheat. Uh, and the 520, uh, 540 was a tough resistance area. Okay. So we're going to be seesawing a little bit until once we get the combines rolling, do you think we'll start to see some confidence uh, return to this market and move us strongly one way or the other? Well, I think probably the weight of the market and the weight of the world market is really what's going to pressure us because there's a lot of competition around the world. For example, we can move to the upside like we did this week, but, you know, the strong dollar you could see on Friday really just took the wind out of the sales, you know, up almost a full percentage point. And so you're back to reality. The rest of the world uh, is uh, aggressive sellers. And the end user really just sits back and waits for uh, better opportunities, particularly as you're approaching uh, harvest and, you know, yields uh, or uh, production around the world also is pretty sizable. So advice for producers, hang in there till we get to those 515s, 520s and, and look to make some sales? Well, I think you're right at the resistance areas right now. You're just about to start harvest. You're uh, overbought in the wheat. Uh, you've had a strong rally off the bottom, 60 cents. You know, so I think if you're looking at catch-up sales, you know, these are your opportunities and then harvest starts. All right. Well, now let's talk about this corn market. Uh, a little bit down, 360 on the nearby. Where is this old crop corn headed? The corn market actually is kind of caught. It doesn't know whether to follow the uh, wheat market higher or follow the soybeans lower. And soybeans went into contract lows this week. And realistically, we've been in about a 14 cent trading range on corn from about 356 on July to 372, caught in that range. And, uh, you know, I think when you look at it, uh, the basis level starting to crack a little bit. We're putting more carry into the market. And uh, probably realistically, we think we're in a trading range on July corn between that 350, you know, we settled at 360, but between 350 and 375, we think we march along, but as we get ever so close to pollination, what we're afraid of is that the corn market starts to follow the soybean market lower, and we are looking at a new range, probably try and push down more like 330 to 350. So I think it's a market that wants to continue to erode. Uh, funds continue to press the market, big shorts in the market, but when you look at it, a producer, the producers in the United States are five times as long as the uh, funds are short. So uh, time buys grain, and that's what you have to be uh, afraid of. But any time you could get a weather uh, scare, you know, Mike. And five times as long and still holding the uh, at least a batch of it on the farm. 
uh, the U.S. producer is today. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's going to be, so for those guys sitting on all that old crop corn, as we hit that 370, 375 potentially, probably should start to make some sales. Well, I think you have to ask yourself between now and harvest, how many opportunities do you get? We just had a 14 cent rally. And the problem that you have with the market is time is marching along. And uh, so far, the planting progress is pretty, uh, pretty aggressive, probably up around 93% planted. Going to have our first crop rating come out on uh, Tuesday, be closed Monday. It's probably going to be up around 80%. Last year, we were 76%. Remember, last year, we had a record yield of 171. So there's still a chance for the acres and the yield to grow in reports to, uh, going forward. So, yeah, I think it's a, a time problem unless we get weather problems. And certainly with the funds this short, you can get fast, short-covering rallies, but they're hedging opportunities. Right. Take advantage of them when they come. Now, as we take a look at new crop, for the past two weeks, basically, we've seen that 374 and change level hold. Does that seem to be a meaningful line of support, or is that just kind of where happenstance has left us so far? No, I, I think it's just that there's no new crop selling out, you know, at these prices levels. Remember a year ago uh, we were sitting at uh, 472 about this time frame on December uh, 14 corn and then we inched all the way down remember down under 320 the first of October. So now you're sitting on a ledge here just above this uh, 375, uh, 380 area. We're kind of caught here on the low end. But I think when you look at it, that probably as we get closer to pollination, if we don't have problems, you're going to see that market inch down and break the 370 market down to 350. And ultimately, we think in the fall, we're going to, uh, if, if you thought 320 was uh, a low last year, certainly we have a chance to uh, tackle that and probably go down into that 292, probably 315, 320 on the downside. So there's plenty of downside, but the market's respectful of what could happen in case weather problems uh, would occur, which they can, but right now it's uh, El Nino year and it looks like a lower bet. We've seen decent rain so far. Now, as we uh, look to talk about the soybean market here, it's been the second week in a row of big downward moves, 29 cents down in the soybeans. Where, from the producer's perspective, does this bleeding end? Well, or is it, is it just starting, you know? And I think the thing you have to be careful of right now, November beans closed at 907. We're uh, ever so close to uh, falling into the eights on the soybeans. Last year, November beans had a, a low of uh, $9 October 1st. But when you uh, step back from it, that was a record tight uh, ending stocks year last year uh, about this time. Uh, we're at, at a nine year high, 500 million carry out on new crop beans could easily be 600 million if acres go up one to two uh, million. So downside objectives, you know, uh, could uh, easily be around this $8 futures mark and take a basis off of that. That's not a very good price, but um, still respectful of the weather, you know, and historically, just as uh, in corn, you can have these weather rallies. If you start, you know, the uh, historically been about 70, 75 cents on beans, 40 cents on corn. Last year we did not have a, a big weather scare, so that's the issue. So with, uh, with the American farmers still very long, new crop soybeans, what's the best way for producers to handle this, this downturn in price, but really the bigger issue is that potential existing risk to the downside yet? Do you sell futures directly at this point, or would you put a, a put in place? Well, I think a year ago we were 12.53 on November beans, now we're 9.07. I think that you have to have some risk management in place at these lower levels. You know, you're probably looking at buying like a 920 put, selling a 1020 call, see if you can uh, break to the downside, maybe a, a little bit of a rally, uh, then get some tighter sales on, and you can uh, cover the uh, sales with some insurance to the upside with call calls. Okay. Now we do have a, a great question here from uh, from Sam in Lincoln, Nebraska. He's one of the folks that follows us on Twitter. We encourage all of you to check us out on Twitter and on Facebook. You can find us at Market to Market, and uh, Sam is curious as we're talking soybeans what caused soybean meal to stay in the green Friday morning while beans kept diving lower we've seen meal stay fairly tight to beans in this downfall but Friday they, they separated a little bit talk to us a little bit about that meal market well, the meal market is the one that really, from an end user standpoint, I mean, that's the end product is a soybean meal and uh, it's still trying to cover in from last year's tight supplies. But I think it's just a matter of time before the meal market just continues to, uh, to uh, leak lower. Uh, it's come from as much as anything else. Uh, Argentina is the largest soybean meal exporter in the world as, long as, as well as the largest soil oil exporter in the world. So I think the strikes that we're having in Argentina are probably a little bit of the issue. Uh, so, you know, the b b bear stories mass just a little bit. Now, do you think that bear story, if avian flu continues, given that uh, soy meal is such a, such a portion of the ration of those, those birds, would it have an impact, uh, a bigger impact than we've already seen? 
Yeah, the soybean meal market has some downside to potential, and it's some of the avian flu, but you know, it just is, uh, doesn't seem to get a lot of respect by the marketplace yet. But it's as much as anything else that uh, China is pretty mature on their purchases. They're bloated with imports. They have negative crush margins. They're saturated with soybean meal, so uh, you know they're a, a big consumer. So that's an issue also. Okay, meal under three hundred. Do you think in the short term? I think so. I think when you look at the soybean uh, market potential, the downside and the crush margins, I think you have to say it's two steps down, one up. Okay. Well, now let's talk the cotton market. We saw a big downward move this week, especially considering all the rains in cotton territory. And as we talked, their planting as, plantings are slow. Uh, what, how do you explain this downward trend? Well, I think when you look at it, the cotton plantings are slow, but also the moisture has improved. You had people planting on dry land cotton that we haven't seen for a number of years, some cases four years. The uh, cotton market is as much the same as the other commodity markets in the uh, you know, around 2009, 2010, we were, went down to 40, and, you know, now we're sitting around $60. So, uh, you know, this market uh, is one that was soybeans uh, and everything else leaking lower. It also is a supply bear market. Uh, of course, China holds uh, most of the cards from what happens from the supply demand standpoint, but they're bloated with stocks also. So we think it's a market that probably wants to leak lower uh, as we go into the fall. Should producers be making some sales today, given that it could leak lower, given the ongoing supply burdens in China, or do you wait and see what this this summer weather brings? Yeah, I think it's very much like the uh, the, the soybean market. It probably is going to you know continue to break down. But when you see short covering rallies, uh, you know five dollars, you know go to work and get some uh, risk management in place. Get something probably a put in place on these cotton. That's prices. what I'd say. Buy a put, sell a call, and uh, see if, how far it can leak to the downside. All right. Now let's talk cattle. Let's talk these livestock stock markets. Uh, the cattle trade, again, relatively dull week on the board. I mean, up and down, up and down, but at the end of the week, 39 cents lower. Where do you see this, this cattle contract headed, live cattle? The cattle, uh, cattle market's really been caught in a, in, a, in a trading range market, really, on June. If you look at it, the trade just got too bearish too quick and uh, anticipating that the cash cattle are going to break. Each week we go by, uh, cash cattle trade steady, maybe a little bit lower, right around this 160, 161. Um, box beef hit an all-time high this week. and then Again. Uh, again, and it looks like it's a spike top this time as we're going to start to leak lower on the cash. A year ago, uh, it is kind of a head scratcher, and this is the reason people are pressing the cattle market on the upfront. A year ago, June cattle were around 140, and we're going to have supplies that are about 1.3 percent more. So why are we uh, higher with uh, with bigger supplies? And I think the the answer really is the fact that the demand's been pretty good. So watch the consumer. We think you're up at risk management areas on the cattle across the board. Uh, it's hard to be bearish on cattle because of the numbers, but it's easier to be negative when you look at the overall supplies of meats this next year are going to be up about 4% if you count meat and poultry. Okay. Now, Cattle on Feed report came out during trading hours today. Didn't do a whole lot to the market, but uh, anything surprising in there producers should watch for over the next month? Well, that was the first time we've ever had a cattle on feed report during the uh, trade live, so it uh, wasn't a, uh, a big uh, deal, though we do it in the grains all the time. But uh, uh, placements were down 5%. That's because of the good uh, pasture conditions. And uh, overall, it just it was positive to the back months on cattle. What it probably did is give you, it gave you an opportunity to get some risk management on if you wanted to in those deferred months. Remember, the government is holding lofty numbers for the fourth quarter, 156 to 170. Uh, their margin of error is usually usually six dollars, uh, maybe seven. Uh, so if you look at it, we're probably pretty well priced if you take their margin of air at the top end of the range, uh, fully dialed in, I think, some of this bull news. All right. Now, the feeder cattle market, we did see a little bit of an upward move. We've seen strong cash sales of feeders. Again, you mentioned great pasture conditions. Uh, where do you see this headed in the short term? Yeah, the cattle market, really, the feeder cattle market has a two-pronged bull story. One, the pasture conditions continue to improve. The other thing is that the uh, uh, grain prices continue to come under pressure. So uh, feeder cattle are, uh, you know, demanding a higher price right now. But we really think it's more a function of what happens with live market. Feeder cattle probably are a 190 to the downside, probably a 230 to the upside in, in that some kind of range. So great opportunity for some risk management here at that 215, 220 level. Yeah, I think most definitely, and, and there again, you can uh, you know go straight with some uh, hedges, or you can use some kind of risk management with uh, put calls. All right. Now, in the lean hog market, it's been a uh, tremendous, tremendous market to watch as this bird flu story kind of took off. Uh, this week, we saw a little bit of an upward move here in the June lean hogs. Have we peaked out here in the near term? Do you think in hogs? 
Well, seasonally, the hog market's doing what it usually does. It usually rallies uh, $25 a hundredweight from the uh, uh, winter to the, the summer highs. You know, we're running into that type of a, a range again. We think it's fully dialed in the uh, bull story. And if you look at the uh, numbers that the government puts out, the hogs were uh, over the projections that the government has. Remember, for the fourth quarter, they're really in that uh, 57 to 63 dollar range on uh, the fall months in October. You know, when it gets up 73, 75, it looks pretty lofty. So we don't think that the expansion uh, has been uh, halted. We think the grain prices are too low. Um, so we'll see on the next hog and pig report, but overall we're still supply bearish on the hogs on this rally. Now in the livestock slaughter report, uh, the April lean hogs, for the first time I think in at least a year, the, the carcass weights were down. We saw a little four pound decrease. Is that a trend do you think or was that just a blip and we'll see as, as corn and beans trade lower, we'll see those hogs get fatter again? Well, I think it's a seasonal thing, number one. And then number two, you really may remember you're comparing it to a year ago. And a year ago we had the PED virus. And so we didn't have the numbers. Uh, we were down like eight and nine percent. So what the uh, industry was really, uh, Packer was really trying to do is promote bigger weights and we did. So now we're going the other way and we're, we're starting to see those weights come down. But that's part of the issue. They'll come back again to the upside as we go to the fall. All right, Don, before we let you go, quick thoughts on crude oil. Do you think we're gonna see some relief at the gas pump again? Well, the crude oil, we think, is at the top end of the range. And the problem with the crude oil, when it gets too low, you can shut the spigot off, and then you can turn it back on at the higher end. So it's, uh, it's at the top end of the range again. All right. Well, Don Rose, thanks for joining us this week. Thank you, Mike. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Don and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts as well as streaming video of our program exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll ride along with an elite group of storm chasers. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.